to everyone. Good, Good morning. 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 You have to unmute your microphone. Uh, I am. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay, but I, I don't hear Murray, so <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Good morning. Ah, good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the actually official first session of the Interpret Europe 2021 uh, conference, Recreating Tourism Truth Heritage Interpretation. I'm very happy that you've joined us. Uh, I will be your um, host uh, moderator. So. Um, um, good morning to everyone who are a part uh, of this session and listening um, what is uh, going on at the conference. Uh, before I, um, I announce um, our first presenters, uh, very shortly, I would like to, to invite you to go to the uh, dashboard of the Interpret Europe uh, conference when you log. In on the right side, in the whiteboard, you will find this nice uh, background. I have it in a many variants adapted for different uh, screens. So please do if you want, uh, you're welcome uh, to use it. So uh, I would like to announce that uh, this first session is entitled Land, Stories, People and Place, the ups, the downs and the preparations for a new climate future. Our presenters are coming from the United Kingdom, Murray Ferguson and Claire Cooper. Welcome again. And they are going to talk about two different projects which took place at the largest national park in the UK, that is um, Kearney Gorms National Park. These two projects are uh, very different in origins, but uh, in the last uh, three years, they also faced this um, uh, experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. But in spite of being uh, different and using different tools, uh, actually um, our hosts are excited to tell us about the plans to use the interpretation based looking forward and, and approaches uh, to tackle the climate and biodiversity challenges. So please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, somebody needs to let me share the screen. Um, it says host disabled currently. Okay. okay. Yes. Got it. Our technicians will do it. Great. Well, listen, thank you. Good morning, everyone who's listening and um, watching. Thank you so much for this invitation to Murray and myself to share our experiences of recreating tourism through heritage interpretation. We're speaking to you from the Cangorms National Park in northern Scotland. Um, as uh, Vasilka said, it's the biggest national park out of 15 in the UK, covering the highest area of mountain ground in Scotland. Uh, and also covering about 6% of rural Scottish land mass. The mountains, they're not quite as big as many of yours in Europe, but they're up to 1,300 metres and surrounded by uh, forested valleys, which we call straths, and extensive forest cover, uh, largely Scots pine, which is our iconic tree, uh, Pinus sylvestris, and birch, the betula species. 18,000 people live in the park, and we have over 2.1 million visitors a year. 75% of land is privately owned and only 12% in public ownership. The remainder is owned by a number of large conservation charities. Uh, the park has four aims, conservation, recreation and sustainable use of resources and sustainable development of areas and communities, all to be delivered together. And it's important to understand that there are other very fine areas of Scotland that are not national parks, but this part of Scotland was crying out for more coordinated management, hence the designation of National Park 18 years ago. Uh, so today we'll be speaking about two areas of the park in the southeast and the west, the Cataran Echo Museum, of which I am one of the founders, and the Badenoch area, uh, which Murray Ferguson from the park will present on. 
Uh, and there you can see this next slide, if it comes up, oops. Uh, you can see how each of these areas sit together in the geography of the Kangal National Park. So I'm going to start by telling you about the Cataran Echo Museum, uh, which is only the second in Scotland. It's set across a thousand square kilometres of eastern Perthshire and western Angus, uh, which is kind of in the middle of Scotland, uh, with a good chunk of it, as you can see, with that yellow boundary stretching up into the park. And it's worth noticing, uh, noting that our southern edge is only about 13 miles from the city of Dundee uh, and about 17 miles from the city of Perth. Uh, so launched in November 2019, uh, just before the pandemic, we aim to tell a story of this part of Tayside across 6,000 years of human history and 400 million years of geological history. And like many parts of Scotland, we have a treasure trove of natural and cultural heritage to draw on. Uh, we have huge uh, megaliths and Pictish stone symbols, unknown stories from the great legends of King Arthur and the pan-Gallic hero Finn McCool, contemporary histories of the Scottish traveller community, important events linked to the great Jacobite rebellions, fables of the Catarans themselves, the Highland clan warriors who came to be associated with cattle raiding in the 17th and 18th centuries. You can discover the history of Scotland's berry capital, Blair Gary, we grow lots of strawberries and raspberries and all sorts of other berries as well, and visit the site of its 12 Victorian textile mills, uh, including Oak Bank Mill, which was the first to spin jute, which was a very big invention back in the day. You can walk a part of the a Highland Boundary Fault in Ailiff and enjoy its well-preserved Old Town Centre. A hike along the Cataran Trail, one of Scotland's great long-distance footpaths, offers you spectacular views through huge landscapes sculpted by glaciation and traversed by old drove roads and ancient rights of way. Uh, and now, just to, uh, as a result of two rounds of uh, raising finance over the last four years, um, uh, which uh, was actually re relatively successful given the pandemic, um, we have uh, eight walking itineraries, 14 cycling itineraries, uh, and two car itineraries, all hung around 134 points of cultural and natural heritage. Uh, and they have all been researched, photographed, and filmed almost entirely by people who live and work in the Echo Museum area. And they're all available primarily through our interactive website, our Vimeo and SoundCloud platforms, through digitized leaflets and booklets and some print. In terms of challenges, the principal one has certainly been raising money. Uh, to begin with, some funders told us we were too ambitious for a rural community. Um, that uh, is a pattern we've often found but ignored. Uh, we've also have uh, no paid fundraising resource. So all of this work to get the uh, finance together is done by our director group. Um, and certainly in our field, only about 30% of our funding applications are successful, which means huge amounts of time is wasted developing bids uh, that fail. And of course, the pandemic also hit uh, our fundraising efforts very badly, as it, uh, as it did with everyone. It's also the case with project funded initiatives, as we are, that money arrives inconsistently, which means that sometimes there's lots of things going on and at other times nothing much is going on, which creates challenges for uh, our communications and the development of our identity. So before I tell you a bit more about the kinds of heritage experiences we're offering uh, in relation to this theme of the conference, a bit more about what is special about Echo Museums and the opportunities they offer. Some of you on the call may know a lot about this, but they originated in France in the 1970s and they focus on the identity of a place with the term echo being a shortened form for ecology. Still a relatively new concept, there are around 300 worldwide and only one other in Scotland on Sky. And they're set in specific landscapes um, and they are a unique combination of three things. So they're an opportunity for local people to share the distinctive heritage of where they live in a way that's meaningful to them. So it's not somebody coming in from outside telling us what is of value, we are deciding that ourselves. And it's this much more holistic nature and culture frame for the interpretation of heritage, quite different to the focus on specific items and objects performed by traditional building-based museums. And it's a focus for the development of a new approach to tourism, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the new approach to tourism, and I'm so glad that this came up in the uh, first talk. Uh, oh, I'm going to go on. Is that okay? Somebody's just here. Um, I'm very glad that the idea of regenerative tourism came up um, in uh, the first part of the conference. 
uh, we've chosen to focus on that in the Echo Museum, and it is about leaving things better. Um, sustainable tourism, it's now felt uh, by some tourism professionals, tends to focus on reducing the negative impacts of tourism. It's sustainable as, it long, as long as it doesn't make a place worse. Regenerative tourism practices, on the other hand, aim to replenish and restore what we've lost, destroyed or degraded by helping to build human communities that thrive whilst enabling the natural infrastructure on which we all depend to thrive too. And again, this has come up already, even pre-COVID, there was a growing recognition that the industrial production and consumption models of tourism were uh, producing diminishing returns for providers and host communities, overcrowding destinations, placing excessive pressure on scarce resources of land, water and energy, failing to take sufficient responsibility for managing and minimizing its waste and preserving the environmental and cultural resources on which it depends. And certainly uh, uh, around us here in Scotland, and I'm sure it's the same across Europe, COVID's impact has underlined the fragility and lack of resilience of individual tourism businesses and the economies of communities which are dependent on it. And in the context of not only COVID and likely future pandemics, but the even bigger climate and biodiversity crisis, makes it imperative that we develop a form of tourism that not only enables host communities to be more resilient, but enables the natural systems on which we all depend to flourish as well. Uh, and we believe regenerative tourism offers this, which is why we're focusing on it. But it's not an easy thing to transition into as it requires a change in worldview. It means moving away from the current extractive worldview to a whole systems view, which recognizes that real value can only be created through thriving host communities existing interdependently with flourishing natural environments. The host ecosystem, if you like, both its human and biotic communities need to be the focus. And it's only from that place-based level that tourism can be regenerative. Our pilot is very simple, designed in three phases. It will bring everyone involved in the visitor economy across the thousand square kilometers of our host ecosystem together. Um, and it would uh, start to introduce them to the concept and how it differs from existing uh, green, sustainable, responsible, and all the other descriptors that are around at the moment, tourism practices, and how it's already being put into beneficial practice elsewhere in the world. The city of Flanders is one high profile example and New Zealand is also now embracing the concept. Uh, and then we'd want to offer opportunities to reflect on the hard realities of putting this approach into practice uh, and hear how other, others already on this road are managing to redesign the plane whilst flying it, because that's what we're going to have to do. Uh, and then we want to get everyone involved to roll up their sleeves and collectively redesign this entire um, tourism value chain that is on the screen to model regenerative practices from how the invitation to visit was framed and communicated to travel choices to the kinds of accommodation on offer and most importantly the kinds of regenerative experiences on offer and behind all that we will need to build new business models that embody regenerative tourism values so as we try to get this pilot off the ground uh, and raise the money to do it, which uh, has to be said is a challenge, uh, we're using the finance we've raised in the last year or so to practice what we preach, if you like, and grow the regenerative experiences that the Echo Museum has itself to offer. So one uh, major focus over uh, the last year is to develop um, active travel for leisure experiences. And active travel here in Scotland means walking and cycling. Uh, we've doubled the number of our pre-designed heritage-based cycling and walking itineraries, and we've begun to promote the Echo Museum as one of Scotland's best car-free holiday destinations. Part of this work is to make it easier for people to understand how they can arrive in the Echo Museum car-free via public transport uh, and cycle taxis. Um, a huge challenge, uh, and it'd be interesting to know if this is the same elsewhere in Europe, because the green travel infrastructure between cities and rural areas in Scotland is still very poor. Um, we've also started to encourage local people to offer guided walking and cycling experiences, and we started designing new family-friendly cycling events, linking people to our natural and cultural heritage. For example, this year, we created an event that asked participants to match 11 riddles, especially composed by our poet in residence, with 11 heritage sites, and it was hugely successful. And we've also commissioned a major piece of public art relating to the heritage of the area uh, right in the Cairngorms National Park, which you have to walk or cycle to in order to fully experience, of which more shortly. 
We're also looking at developing a range of volunteerism experiences, a mixture of travel and volunteering, uh, which will involve visitors helping to leave things better, for example, by contributing to community archaeology initiatives uh, and engaging in citizen science projects that help local habitat preservation and restoration. Uh, one example of a citizen science visitor experience that we are testing out this year is through the launch of a new paleoecological study of one of the Echo Museum's rivers. Paleoecology, as you may know, investigates past environments and it's being increasingly used to understand how ecosystems can be conserved and restored in the light of climate change and biodiversity collapse. Our project will collect all sorts of di new different kinds of data to create a new story about the river, that highlights how human behaviors have degraded and are degrading its biodiversity uh, and how climate change is affecting its water course. Um, and our hope is that we can extend this kind of approach across the seven rivers of the Echo Museum, thereby developing regular opportunities throughout the year for visitors to engage in helping the natural infrastructure on which we all depend to thrive. We've also been trialing a, a variety of learning experiences in heritage-based knowledge and skills uh, that are not only enjoyable and authentic in and of themselves, but actually reintroduce people to ideas that might help them take regenerative action in their everyday lives. So one, just to give you one example, called Bring Back the Bannock, that's the top left-hand um, uh, photo, uh, takes this ancient Scottish flatbread food and tells its story in such a way as to emphasise the importance of sourcing local sustainable food. Um, and of course, there are numerous examples from our past about how we designed out waste and pollution, kept products and materials in use and regenerated our natural systems. Indeed, the whole concept of the circular economy goes back to at least the Bronze Age. Another regenerative experience we've developed this year is a story bank of films called Rooted. 13 stories have been curated and retold by our storyteller in residence, all of which illuminate how past communities from all cultures understood their interdependence with trees and passed on that knowledge and the values that went with it through stories, myths and legends. And we'll be using the story bank to promote another new pre-designed itinerary we're developing uh, that visitors will be able to enjoy, which is called My Favourite Tree, which is asking 20 local people to identify a publicly accessible tree and tell the story of why it's special and important to them. That photo on the slide is one of our leading local climate activists, Len Seal. Commissioning new public art when we can raise the funding for it is an important part of our approach to heritage interpretation. This year in time for COP26, we're creating a 50 meter long, two meter high timeline of 20,000 years of climate change in this part of Scotland, which will be exhibited in one of the Echo Museum's main towns. Its message is simple. Our climate is changing. This is not the first time it has changed, but it is the first time it has been changed by us. Um, and what lessons are we actually going to learn from the past uh, that will help shape a more regenerative future. Um, and connected to the exhibition is an artist in residence who's working with that uh, town and its community to create another piece of public art that manifests that more regenerative future. Um, so another example of this approach, again made by local artists, is of a giant's hand coming out of the side of one of the hillsides in Glenshee uh, in the southern edge of the Cairngorms National Park. It's made out of jute and geotextile and pinned to the hillside with steel pins. And it's inspired by the Glen's strong links with the legendary Pangallic hero from the pool. A number of events aimed at visitors and local people will take place over the two months or so it will be up. But one I'm very excited about uh, will take place on the first day of COP26 when we plan to wake him up with the sound of the Carnix, the great Pictish warhorn that you can see on the right there. Um, because um, in the old stories of Finn, he is asleep under the mountains with his warriors waiting to be woken up with this signal of the horn being sounded three times so that he can come to our aid. Um, so whilst this may have been a fight uh, for a great battle in the past cultural memory, we think that we need his aid now uh, in terms of the climate crisis. So our view is that we need these ancient stories which are part of our heritage, heritage to wake us up today and to re-enchant us with the courage we need to face the crises ahead. 
Um, so that is a very, very quick snapshot of where the Catalan Echo Museum has got and our plans to recreate tourism through heritage interpretation. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Murray. Murray, I'm happy to move the slides on for you if you want me to, or do you want, or do you want to do that yourself? I think, I think I'll do, try and do my, that myself, Claire. So if you shut down, I'll try and share my screen. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can see that all okay. Is that okay? Can you see the screen? That's good. Um, good morning, everyone. And um, first of all, thank you to Claire for giving such a brilliant um, start to the session. I've, I've learned a lot about Claire's work just through, through hearing that. And I hope you can see just the power of having um, local enthusiasts and entrepreneurs like Claire on the ground and, and what they can do um, uh, when they get the, the wind behind them. Um, so I'm going to be telling you about the second part of our presentation, and I'm talking about the Badenoch area, um, which is on the west of the Cairngorms National Park. Um, Claire's already given a really good summary about the, the National Park um, background and purpose, and I'd only just add that we are, of course, um, a charter park under the Europark um, uh, system of uh, sustainable tourism in protected areas. And also, very recently, we've signed up to the Tourism Declares Initiative, um, um, committing to address climate change targets. Um, and we did that in cooperation with the Business Partnership, which is the Chamber of Commerce for the park. So that's been quite a, a, a new recent development. Um, just as an idea of scale, um, the Cairngorms National Park is, qu is quite large. It's clear that it covers about 6% of rural Scotland. But that pink area, the Badenoch area that I'm speaking about today, you can probably drive that in about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, but I'll just give you a wee, a wee idea of scale. That's the area I'm talking about. Um, so the Badenoch area has a very distinctive landscape. I mean, that, that photograph there is taken looking towards the central Cairngorms Mountains around which the whole national park is designated. But the Badenoch area is more low-lying and its name um, in Gaelic comes from um, the, uh, a term that means the flooded lands, because it historically has been a very wet area. Uh, it still contains the Inch Marshes, which is one of one of the largest, uh, well, it is the largest natural flood plain uh, in the UK. Um, it's a, a farmed and forested area, um, and you will see many photographs of uh, history and heritage through the presentation, particularly this one, this one castle uh, called Ruthven Barracks, um, which was built in the 1700s to address uh, Jacobite rebellions. Um, the area has also got a very distinctive culture. Um, this is a photograph of a Shinti team, uh, Shinti being a sport that is like a extreme violent version of hockey, uh, played particularly in the northwest of Scotland and in Ireland. Um, it's thought to be one of the oldest uh, still existing sports it's absolutely fascinating to watch. I, I, can't, I really can't underestimate the, the hardness of the people that play this sport. And there's intense rivalry between the, the villages who, who play the sport. Um, it, the area, Badenoch area, is also a stronghold um, of the Gaelic language, uh, which is now more in the north and west of Scotland. But within the eastern highlands, um, the, the Gaelic culture is still very, very strong in Badenoch. So the project uh, emerged from a combination of opportunities and threats. And first of all, on the negative side, um, there's a, a, the, the main road that goes from the north to south of Scotland passes right through the Badenoch area, um, and that's being upgraded at the moment. And there was concerns in the community that the whole of the area is going to be bypassed even more once the road is completed. Um, the town centres are struggling, particularly during the COVID period, and there was fears about just, just the general loss and erosion of the distinctive culture of the Badenoch area. But on the more positive side, there's a lot of really strong things to build on. There's a fantastic folk park in the area, Highland Folk Park, and a, and a, and a big uh, commercial wildlife park, a sort of outdoor zoo, Highland Wildlife Park. <clears throat> and they have many, many visitors. But the feeling was the visitors go there, they pay their fees, and then they leave the area. And if only they could be encouraged to stay and visit the broader area, we would all benefit. Um, 
And that was combined with this sense that there was a real underexploited heritage, as you'll see, that could still be developed and made more accessible. There was very strong local enthusiasm for this. And in sustainable tourism terms, this is generally a quieter area of the park. I mean, Scotland, like many parts of Europe, has seen an enormous growth in tourism, and some parts are overloaded. And this, there was a feeling that this relatively accessible park could actually absorb many more visitors with the support of the local community. And to some extent, that will take pressure off the busier areas. So as we developed the project, there was a very happy coincidence of three separate factors. Uh, in our management plan for the park, we had just identified the area on the, the west of the slide there um, as being a special priority area where we needed to give special attention. And to be honest, we weren't entirely sure how to do that when we wrote this plan. We just could see that this was an area requiring more resources, more, more effort, more impact. But at the same time, the National Lottery Heritage Fund developed a new placemaking project and what they wanted to do was select parts of Scotland to try and embed heritage and placemaking more within the, uh, the, the development of policy and try and raise the profile of her heritage and cultural issues. So we could bid for that fund. And then coincidentally, the community had, had literally at their own instigation and with almost no public funding or support, had, had just done a fairly extensive heritage mapping exercise and came to us saying, we've done this work and we thought you'd be interested, but we're not entirely sure what to do with it. So managing to put these three things together, um, we developed a partnership project called the Badenoch Great Place Project. And our tagline at the start at least was about bringing the past into the 21st century. And we had another photograph of Ruthven Barracks. This, this site is so visible and so, uh, especially from the main road that passes the area, it is the kind of iconic photograph of the, of the area. The project aims were fourfold, um, very much about <clears throat> de developing a strong destination and um, turning heritage assets into economic uh, and experiential opportunities, involving a wider range of people, and that meant both visitors and locals, and developing a sustainable partnership. And we had a fairly simple structure. Um, we had a project board made up of the main funding partners, the five communities in the area, uh, and the tourism and business associations. And with the funds that we generated, which were around about the uh, 500,000 euro mark over, over a three year period, um, we employed one project manager and had a budget to spend on stuff. Uh, now, the funding package we developed was very clear. This was not for the construction of new visitor centers or even, even major works on the ground. Um, it was very much about the softer stuff um, that is necessary to do all of this work, as you will see. So tra training, skills, marketing work, development of materials was fine. Capital build on the ground. We just didn't have the budget to do that. Um, so we, I can't go out through all the things we did, but just some of the highlights. Um, as you would expect, we developed an interpretation strategy, and that was based on all the community-led asset mapping. And there was the general work that I'm sure you're all immersed in about development of themes, et cetera. Um, one thing that came out very quickly was that the area, we needed a new way to talk about the area. And there was extensive work with it went into this. Um, and in the end, the, what we came, came out of the pipe was this concept of Bednoch, the storylands. And the idea was we wanted to find a new way to enthuse and unite people about communicating about cultural heritage and to show what was different about Bednoch. And it was very much an effort that was wanting to combine the concepts of land, land and people's use of land and stories. And um, the, the, the cycle of discussion we went through repeatedly sometimes was all about we, we want to use the history, we want to use heritage, but we don't want to use any of these words. Um, Claire, we did consider the concept of eco museum, but for various reasons locally that didn't go down too well. Um, so we've plumped for um, Badenoch, the Storylands, for just now. And it's fascinating to see such different approaches on different sides of the park, when fundamentally, I think we're absolutely trying to do the same thing. Um, we also stimulated the further development of a new local charity called Badenoch Heritage. Uh, it already existed in a very basic form, but we've really helped them uh, become established, renew their board, and we now have a really strong local structure in place. And that's so important so that we have a vehicle to work with local people, to raise funds, to manage projects and, and involve people. Um, we've 
uh, stimulated and strengthened the concept of a week-long heritage festival, which just took place last week. We're all still slightly exhausted from it. Um, and uh, that is very much community-led. It's a packed week that involved community archaeological digs, school events, um, commissioned music, um, uh, a fascinating talk last week about the history of sheep um, in the Cairngorms area and a whole lot of other work. And we hope that will go from strength to strength in future years. Uh, like Claire, we have, and the Cutter and Eco Museum, we have developed a, a plethora of new routes and itineraries that are very much prioritised towards walking and cycling and then driving. So very much about slow tourism, very much about slowing down and discovering your local area. And the thinking was trying to develop itineraries that the staff and volunteers at these major visitor attractions they could get into conversations with their visitors about and say why don't you why, why don't you stay another day why next time you come why don't you go here if you're interested in outlander which is a huge issue uh, the, the television series a huge uh, additional attraction here why don't you go and visit these other sites that are very much linked to to that theme uh, on top of that, we encourage the local community to, to develop their website, which they now run and manage, uh, and that has all of the business listings on it. It's also linked in with the overall National Park websites um, that are run by the, the Chamber of Commerce and the National Park Authority. And we've developed um, through a very innovative, innovative project with Scottish Government and Transport Scotland, the National Transport Agency, uh, a new app. Um, which uh, downloads all the information onto the phone so you don't need to have total digital connectivity. And this has proved to be a really fascinating vehicle for the collection of stories and music and visual information linked to georeferencing so that people can go out and discover these new places. Um, it's something that we're very much looking to develop further as we go forward. Um, it's a great platform for identifying and finding these undiscovered features. We're fortunate in Scotland that people have got very good access rights, so they can access the land as long as they're behaving responsibly uh, without needing landowner permission. And we hope the combination of this app and uh, those access rights will really help people explore the area positively. Um, we've done quite a bit of work um, capturing new images and new drone footage of the area. It was great to involve younger people in that, especially during the COVID period. And I think that has really opened up the eyes of some younger people and their teachers about the potential for employment and skills development in this fascinating area. I think there's a tendency for people in the tourism industry to think, you know, tour work working in tourism means serving someone in a bed and breakfast or, or a restaurant. And we've tried to un use this project to unpack the idea that there are so many different types of skills and jobs in tourism and, and, and sustainable tourism going forward. Um, general, generally, we've um, done a lot of work on visualizations because quite a lot of the historic sites we've got are they're hard to they're hard to visualize what they were like when they were at a former period in time. So we've spent money that, um, that and these things have been immensely popular in the local press and on websites and um, recreating um, the, the buildings and the historic sites at a particular point in time. The, the, another shot here of the, the Ruthven Barracks, and we've recently extended the, the long distance route, the Speyside Way, which now goes right past this fantastic um, historic um, artifact. Um, and just generally, the, we found that the power of images has just been immense. This is a, a, a Pictish hill fort where there, there is something to see on the ground in the sense of there is a, a rumble of stones, but really it's not until you see the image um, inspired by archeological knowledge and insights where you really start to get a sense of what once existed here. And that we found that really captures people's imagination. Um, in general terms, we've um, worked with businesses, it's been a very challenging time to work with businesses because they've had immense economic pressures as a result of the COVID emergency. But we've got good relations with the Parkwide Chamber of Commerce, all of the village business and tourism associations. And I think the fascinating thing we're trying to create space for is this sense of entrepreneurship. And again, if, if I've learned anything from Claire, um, it's about the power of working with people who are entrepreneurs and making sure that you're supporting them, providing 
materials to them, getting the barriers out of their way, and then letting them go. And uh, we, we think do, with that general approach, approach, we can achieve great things. We've developed the usual array of marketing resources, but much more important than that was the staff training and discussion sessions we had um, with staff who are often seasonal um, so that they can understand how better we can promote Badenoch and the, the whole of the park. Um, the project has effectively come to an end after a three year period, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But as a legacy project, we have um, found some money to uh, employ uh, Merrin Glover and Hamish Napier, who are two fantastic local characters, an author and an absolutely gifted uh, traditional musician. And they are leading a programme of activity over the winter and hopefully into future years, where they're having sessions every two weeks specifically to encourage a culture of storytelling. So this program's only just started, but they've been attended by 40, 50 people. The people are absolutely fascinated and captivated by this. And we're going to be going into schools. We're going to be doing more intergener intergenerational work. And I think the key thing that has come out of it is there are people in the community who wouldn't normally get involved in this kind of work. So typically estate gamekeepers and people who've worked on the land in a very practical and traditional way and their stories are really untold. There's, it, there's, there's nowhere for them to go to tell their stories. And we're really trying to find new ways through uh, creative arts to help them do that. Um, I won't go through that slide. That's just um, uh, showing some of the highlights and we haven't managed to talk about all of them. Um, just last week, we had the uh, drinks reception to say thank you to some of the volunteers and partners. And Graham Fraser, this man here, um, is a, effectively just a, a retired local citizen who has spent pretty well 24 hours a day uh, over the last two years working for this project. He has put his life and soul into this project. And I think I just wanted to pay homage to him and the many other volunteers without whom this, this project uh, would, would certainly not have been a success. So some reflections and um, the ups, the, the highlights. Um, overall, the project has been a success. I mean, it's, it's locally very popular. It's been great to build on the, co the community enthusiasm that was already there and see that even stronger. Um, we've left some really good, strong key assets for the community to manage. And it's really good to see these now being picked up by the National Tourism Organization, Visit Scotland, and some of the commercial enterprises. They're, they're using our materials, which is good to see. Um, and now that the project's finished, we're inevitably thinking about what is the legacy. Um, next year, uh, there is uh, every two years in Scotland, there is a themed year and where a theme is picked and everyone is encouraged to work around this theme. And in 2022, it's a very good theme for interpreters uh, about Scotland's year of stories. And we think our brand, we're trying to develop a bit of a competitive advantage by getting into the space early. Our brand is very well placed to exploit that heritage. Um, we've left the, the charity stronger and we'll certainly be seeing another Heritage Festival in 2022. And one thing we're really keen to try and do through the legacy is to try and exploit the further potential for younger people. Um, inevitably, the age profile of some of the people invo involved in this kind of work is uh, more elderly, but we, we certainly feel we've started to open the gates for involvement for younger people. Um, the Downs. Uh, well, the absolute tragedy was that our one project manager um, died very suddenly at the age of 38. And that was an absolute tragedy for him, his family, and a shock to all of us. And I think if it left any positive legacy at all, it was just a sense of um, we're not here for a long time and we all have to work very, very hard to make good use of the time when we are here. Oliver was a gifted um, archeologist and a really brilliant communicator and he's such a loss to Scotland. Um, the COVID emergency was very challenging for us, um, but by moving money around and doing things online and working in creative ways with the community, we got through it. Um, we were not in nearly as badly affected as some of the local businesses. Um, the bureaucracy, I, I would just say that some of my colleagues um, have worked incredibly hard beside, behind the scenes, managing budgets, keeping uh, spreadsheets together, and just a, a complex budget like this and working in partnership is always complicated and the bureaucracy is often unseen. Um, I think probably the single biggest frustration for me is that too many partners considered the project, perhaps as I portrayed on that slide, to be a project officer and a budget. 
and they won't often see the potential for them to exploit the benefits of this project through orientating their own work. And it still feels like we could have done more, we could do more in the future if some of the partners were more fully behind, behind the initiative, but we'll get there. And the big question really is how to sustain the community enthusiasm in the long term now that the funding has technically come to an end. So looking forwards, um, I'll just broaden the scope here onto the whole of the National Park and um, with two final slides. Um, the, we have been very fortunate recently to win funding from the Cairngorm, the Heritage Horizons Fund, which is part of the National Lottery. We're one of only five places in the UK to win this funding. And on the back of that, we've ascended, assembled a funding pot of 45 million pounds, which is an enormous sum of money. Um, to deliver a project that is all about people and nature thriving together. So there are going to be 23 separate projects worked up. We're only at the very start of this over a seven year period. Um, and the projects will be addressing three themes about people, power and place. And the power element of that is very much about empowering local people to take decisions that are affecting their own lives as we enter this new climate future. So we'll show you a very short video of about three minutes uh, about that in uh, one minute's time. Um, and I'll just finally close by saying that we are considering our next management plan for the part right at the moment. And we'd be really delighted if any of you internationally would have a look at that and give us any tips or suggestions about how you think we should be managing the area. Um, and using any of your experience, it would be great to, to see that fed into the process. To, to find it, I think if you just search for Cairngorm's partnership plan, you'll see how we've set out our work and it might be useful for you too. So that's my last slide. Uh, and if I close there, I hope our uh, technical experts will be able to show the short video, which lasts about three minutes. No sound. We didn't think this would be our job, but we are more than willing to do it. In Gaelic, there's a word that doesn't exist in English. Dufas. It means the connection between people and nature. We celebrate the songs, poems, and how we speak. Here in the UK's largest national park, we are giving people the power to shape a greener future. Together, we will enhance nature by expanding woodland, restoring peatland, changing the way we work, travel and play. We will improve people's health and livelihoods, connect communities with nature and share our learnings with the world. In the Cairngorms National Park, people and nature will thrive together. One of the things I love about the Cairngorms is its uniqueness. I'm worried uh, about you know, the changes that I see, pictures of retreating glaciers, and you see you know, less snow in the Cairngorms. The way that I always construct it is to think about the impact on our children, uh, on our grandchildren, and what kind of a world we want to leave for them. The green spaces and the community growing initiatives that are happening, I see that as a nice way to bring people together. So social isolation is a big issue. Lockdown and COVID has had a real impact on people and more and more people have been using nature to help cope with that. They say that um, it takes a village to raise a child and it's absolutely true. I would hope his life would be enriched by embracing the community in which he lives in. If you put communities in control of their destiny, it would be far more proactive. We run outdoor programmes and expeditions with people with disabilities and complex needs. Making the Cairngorms more accessible is about presenting a broader set of faces. I don't agree with this bits of ground where it's all farming and then bits of ground where it's all nature. I think it should all coincide with each other, you know. I think that we just have to start farming in a kinder and more environmentally friendly way. This Highlands is our inheritance. That's why we live in harmony with our land. We have a sense of place and also the sense to act now, to create a beacon of inspiration so that others may follow. In Scotland and beyond, 
Let's share our connection to the land, our dukas, with the world. Okay, I think that we finish with the presentation. Dear Claire, dear Murray, thank you very much. I was thrilled. <laughs> I have never been to UK, but you bought me with this presentation. <laughs> Next time to go to, to Garnicorm National Park. Uh, as I can see, see by the comments of the attendees of the conference, um, they will say that it is a fantastic project. I don't want to, um, to read all of them because anyone can uh, see. Um, uh, but there was, ah, there was an answered question. OK. But there was a question by Ms. Ives uh, Vodanovic Lukic, which was directly addressed uh, to Claire about the guy that uh, walks by the locals. Um, and uh, if you want, you can also um, uh, uh, answer it uh, for uh, most of the people yes. because uh, half of them also uh, uh, works uh, directly with the uh, tourism. And I, I, I have uh, my question also, so you can, Claire, you can uh, join it. So how do you motivate people, local people? How do you? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I mean, my experience uh, is that you you start um, small with the people uh, that connect to what you're trying to do easily. Uh, and again, in my experience, over time, as people see what's happening, have more opportunities to get involved in things, that group of people grows. So, for example, when we set up the Echo Museum, we took a kind of roadshow uh, all around the human settlements in the Echo Museum to ask people what kind of routes and uh, experiences they would like to see. Um, and, they, and then we built on that. So people who came and contributed to those sessions could see that they were listened to and the ideas that they came up with actually then took flight. Uh, there was one amazing example in Blair Gowry which is the biggest settlement, human settlement in the Echo Museum, where somebody had done their PhD on the um, industrial textile mills of the River Erect back in the 1950s. Uh, and when he heard about what we were doing, he brought all his old brownie camera photographs for us uh, to actually share as part of the itinerary content. And you can see them on our website. So the word starts to trickle out and then people emerge and you start to grow your community. In terms of the question about guided walks, um, I, I gave a, an answer, but just to reiterate it, it's a great question. It was much harder than we thought to encourage people, local people to, um, to do guided walks and guided cycling rides, even though we had provided the content um, that they could use and adapt to their own style. And the biggest issue was insurance as, um, as the questioner rightly underlined. So what we've decided to do is one of the uh, outcomes, if you like, of this first experiment is try and work out how we could create a, a training program that actually also gave access uh, for insurance to people collectively so that it gave them courage to kind of start off because obviously a lot of money to invest in that at the beginning. So it was a brilliant question. Thank you. Okay. Um... I saw a couple of suggestions in, uh, like from uh, Heidi Demain, suggestion for future visits uh, are great. If you can get visitors to stay an extra day for that special tip, even better. There was another, um, another suggestion for, from Larissa Pietri. Uh, maybe you already know is to promote the accommodations together with the visit of national parks, especially for foreign tourists. 
Yeah, yes, I, I can maybe comment on that. Um, we, across the whole of the National Park, we have a very strong um, business partnership organization who fulfill two purposes. Um, they're, they're a membership organization and they are the Chamber of Commerce for the National Park and they're also the destination uh, management organization from a private sector perspective. And they, um, if you join as a member, that's exactly what they do. They promote all of the accommodation businesses together. They run an excellent website and we fund them to deliver certain outcomes. So th their geography is slightly different, but we're we're certainly involving them in to help promote both the Badenoch area and 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 the the Catherine Eco Museum. But that that sense of provide finding tools to help people work collaboratively for the good of the area that's a real that's a real art, <laughs> uh, and it's very much at the ethos of of the sort of part we're trying to manage because the land is not um, is not publicly owned. The, you know, the essence of the way we're managing the part is trying exactly to do that, finding ways to help people um, work together. Maybe I could just add to that from, um, from our experience in the Echo Museum is that because we are new um, and we have a very particular legal structure, which in, in, in the UK is called a social enterprise, um, we're, not a, we're not a charity uh, like the Cairngorms National Park is. So that means that we can only access certain kinds of money. So what's happened is that um, other community uh, anchor organizations, as we call them, have come to us and said, well, let us help you raise money because we are a charity and you can put the application through us and then uh, we can, you can spend the money as you originally intended. Hugely generous. And of course it creates a, a very, very close relationship with that anchor organization that you can then build on. Okay. Uh, there are messages popping up uh, uh, from Angus Forbes. You said uh, the Badenoch project is now finished, Murray? Uh, well, it, the, the, the partnership, uh, the three year funded Great Place partnership project is finished. Um, but we very much hope that the all of the work around Badenoch, the Storylands, is going to go on, led and managed by the local community organisations. So we will still be there in the background, trying to help them as best we can. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that quite a lot of the money that is going to be coming through this Heritage Horizons programme, which was what the video was about, we will be able to channel that partly towards um, Badenoch, uh, Clare, uh, uh, and of course towards Cataran Eco Museum. Uh, but this is where we need the local organizations to be entrepreneurial, to be imaginative, to take the lead, and, and we'll be able to help them. Okay. Thank you for answering that question. Is there anyone from the conference attendees wants to ask Claire and Marie? Uh, anyhow, I found it uh, very inspirational, and I think that this presentation is very inspirational, as uh, I've heard it about the National Park. But, uh, but um, from the comments, uh, I can see that uh, some of the people never heard about <laughs> Carnivore National Park, so it was really uh, thrilling and uh, inspiring. Uh, to see what you have done toward this uh, responsible uh, eco tourism. Um, if somebody wants anything to ask uh, Claire or Marie, uh, I, 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 yes. I would I would maybe just say, Vasilka, that um, I can see we're coming towards the end of our time. Um, I, I, Claire's a very busy lady, but. I'm sure if anybody wants further information um, or at some future stage wants to come and visit us, um, you know, do, please do keep in touch. Uh, in Scotland, there's a great enthusiasm still for European level cooperation Absolutely. and um, any, anybody who visits will be made yeah. uh, very, very welcome. And you, yes. can get, you can get in touch yes, with us yeah. through the website very easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, as somebody already commented that uh, it will be uh, very good uh, because the local people actually are uh, guiding, yes, these yeah. uh, tours. 
Okay, I... someone asked uh, about the locals were against the term eco museum. Yeah, from well, I... Yes, I can I can maybe take that one. Um, I, I, this was part of the debate we had about what our bra overall brand slogan should be for the area. And there is there is the Highland Folk Park within the Badenoch area. I didn't actually show many pictures of it. It's, it's absolutely first class. Um, and it sometimes gets has been called a folk museum. And when it's been called a folk museum, local people have always said, no, no, it's not a museum. It's about living culture. Uh, and it's we don't it, it's this association of the word museum with something indoors and something that is only about the past. And it was that general sense of, no, no, we don't want to be associated with that. And now I can absolutely see, and I'm very supportive of what Claire is doing in Catran and what the Eco Museum movement is doing. And, and I still think that concept would have quite a lot of traction. But in the Badenoch area, that suggestion for various, some reason, and I think it was associated with this, the way the local folk park had sometimes been misnamed. It, it just, the suggestion just wasn't received positively, I'm afraid. Claire, I don't know if you had similar debates as you were developing well, no, your I mean, concept. Interestingly, I was only introduced to the concept of eco museums in 2017 when I went to a slow tourism conference. So thank you, slow tourism, for in, um, uh, introducing the concept to me. But when I came back and talked to local people here about it, they completely got it immediately. And they said, well, we've got an eco museum already. We just don't call it that. Um, and the other thing, uh, the only other thing that's quite amusing, really, is that lots of people to begin with, but they don't do it now, said, uh, why, why is it echo and not eco? Um, or why are you saying it as echo, not eco? Because echo to most people was to do with the, uh, an echoing sound. And I said I was pronouncing it that way because it was a French word and I was trying to honour the French word. But that's the only negative thing we ever had about it. Okay, there is uh, another uh, question from Max Dugrovko Fiatsko for Claire. It's in the question and answer uh, box. Dear Claire, the question was actually about the guiding license, which is mandatory in some countries like Croatia, where uh, uh, Eves, uh, the previous um, uh, lady which asked the question is from, but also in Macedonia and in many countries in the Balkans, it's uh, mandatory, it's obligatory for the guy to have this uh, uh, license given by the Ministry of Culture or some tourism board or anyhow. But many countries don't have license systems for tour guides, obviously. Uh, no, I didn't fully understand that um, uh, aspect of it, Max. Thank you. Uh, as far as I know, and Murray may be uh, better informed than I am, we don't have a mandatory license in Scotland, but you do need insurance. Yeah. Um, and you and you know most people would say, have you been trained in some shape or form? Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely right. There's no um, mandates of that kind, but you would need assurance, uh, insurance, and you would need to do risk assessments for all of the health and safety legislation. I mean, generally the barriers to entry for that sort of business are relatively low, but it's great to hear the work that Claire is proposing to do to try and encourage more people into the into the industry. Um, we have a system based on uh, training and particularly the blue badge guide system, which is a very high level of, of training, but that is the, the theory around that is that gives you a competitive advantage if you can present yourself as a blue badge guide. It's not a, a mandatory requirement. Okay. Uh, another question from Ives, uh, but maybe it is free of charge. Locals can also organize guided walks, for example, in Croatia. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again, Claire and Murray, for this fantastic, inspirational presentation.